Wonderful. I think everyone's joining us now, so we'll get started in a moment, welcoming everyone into the virtual room. In a mana, in a reo, in a now, rangatira mai, tina koto. Kia koto, te tanga te whenua, nati fatua oraki, e mehenui, kia koto, e tenewa. Kia tato, te hanga ora, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. I would also like to acknowledge the original custodians of Australia and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and hopes of Indigenous Australia. Morena everybody, I'm Sharon Noy, General Manager of The Circle here in New Zealand and it is my pleasure on behalf of The Circle and our partner in New Zealand to warmly welcome our very large audience attending from Australia and New Zealand, as well as of course our guests of honour, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, Sir Peter Gleichman, Rob Fife and our moderator today, Fran O'Sullivan. Thank you so much for your time today, we're all looking forward to hearing more on your perspectives on this very important and of course very timely discussion. I'm also pleased to welcome special guests joining us today, Damonette King, New Zealand High Commissioner to Australia, the Honourable Judith Collins, Leader of the National Party, and Andrew Bailey, Member for Port Waikato for the National Party. I'm also pleased to welcome our many member organisations and friends we work together with on both sides of the Tasman. It's brilliant to have you all with us this morning. I am pleased to acknowledge our partners today in New Zealand, and particularly Ben Evers Swindell, who is Senior Manager for Corporate and Government, and we'll hear from Ben shortly. Before I hand over to Ben, um, the format for today, the briefing will be interactive. We encourage you to keep your cameras on and that you write your question in the chat feed, which Fran will be able to view in due course. She'll ask you to come off mute to participate. We are recording today's session and it is on the record. We welcome the members of the media in the room today. And I'm now pleased to hand over to Ben, who will formally welcome us and introduce our panel today. Over to you, Ben. Morena. Thank you, Sharon. Kia ora, everyone. It gives Air New Zealand great pleasure to partner today briefing on kickstarting the New Zealand economy, accelerating growth through technology and innovation. As we navigate our way through ongoing volatility and uncertainty, our future success at Air New Zealand will continue to be underpinned by technology and our ability to innovate. Technology will help us provide ongoing care and support of our passengers. Whilst we seamlessly connect Kiwis to one another and New Zealand to the rest of the world. We are reliant on ongoing innovation and technology as we rebuild and revive our airline. Technology is increasingly being utilised to remove much of the manual and administrative burden so we can draw on our innate human qualities to focus on taking the best possible care of our customers. As with any other business, Air New Zealand's ability to innovate and more importantly simplify the way we do business will contribute greatly to productivity and kickstarting the New Zealand economy. And on that note, I now take great pleasure in formally introducing our panel today. And we have the Right Honourable Helen Clark, who was the longest serving leader of the New Zealand Labour Party and became Prime Minister of New Zealand for three consecutive terms from 1999 right through to 2008. During her time as Prime Minister, Helen was active in policy development across economic, social, environment, cultural and international portfolios. We also have Sir Peter Gluckman, who's trained as a paediatrician and biomedical scientist and holds a distinguished university professorship at the Liggins Institute of the University of Auckland. Peter has published over 700 scientific papers in perinatal and developmental physiology, neuroscience and endocrinology evolutionary biology and medicine. He has authored both technical and popular science books, and he has written and spoken extensively on science policy, science diplomacy, and science society interactions. We also have Rob Fife, who is a New Zealand businessman and a former CEO of our beloved Air New Zealand. In late March, 2020, Rob was appointed as a liaison between government and the private sector to the extent of the COVID-19 crisis. In the 2021 New Year's Honours, Fife was appointed a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to business and to tourism. 
And finally, our moderator, Fran O'Sullivan, who is Managing Director of NZ Inc. Fran is a former editor of the National Business Review and a prominent columnist for the New Zealand Herald, where she writes on business, politics and international affairs and manages the annual high profile mood of the boardroom project. We certainly look forward to the conversation today and I'll now hand over to Fran to get us all started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, it's my privilege to have such three esteemed speakers on the panel today. And before I ask them to frame up uh, some comments to shape the debate this morning and the discussion and prompt you on the line to uh, think about the questions you want, uh, let me just say each of them was absolutely prominent last year. We got out there, instigated some debate about things that weren't being addressed. And I go back to the um, thinking about Sir Peter Gluckman and when we had the select committee, very prominent uh, there, stimulating uh, debate on questions that were not being addressed at that time. Uh, Rob Fife also as the business liaison uh, between government and also the private sector, not afraid to call it when uh, things had to be said, some hard issues that needed to be debated. And of course, um, Helen Clark, uh, very much prominent in the um, paper that was put together by all three, uh, going back to July of last year, uh, recommending then, if you please, that we might need to think about rejoining the world and the steps to that. So a lot has happened in that time. If I could now pass first to Rob for some framing up comments. Over to you, Rob. Uh, thanks, Fran, and uh, it's great to have, have the opportunity to, to talk with those that are uh, here with us today. Uh, as I look forward to, uh, to how we go about opening up our economy and what our ambitions should be, uh, I, I actually look with some uh, caution in my role on interacting with uh, people around the globe. It's interesting, I just came off a call this morning, uh, one, one of my boards is, is Air Canada, and there's a lot of talk in Canada about the fourth wave of uh, the virus that will hit us in, in uh, full winter uh, later this year in the Northern Hemisphere. They're really concerned about it. I get similar feedback from the UK, despite the rollout of the vaccine there. They're very fearful of what is going to happen in next uh, fall winter. So. I just preface my comments that we're far from out of the woods uh, in, in terms of what lies ahead. In the immediate uh, challenge, you, you know, we look at uh, the big focus at the moment on the uh, Trans-Tasman border. We're very, very keen, obviously, to, in the business uh, community to see that uh, up and running. It again presents some challenges. You know, we've relied so heavily on the border restrictions as our primary barrier to infection uh, coming into New Zealand. And as we move away from that as our primary defence, there is some jeopardy. Uh, we've seen plenty of comment and reviews about how effective our testing regimes are, how effective our contact tracing regimes are, how effective we are at getting people into, uh, into managed isolation. As we free up the border, it's absolutely crucial that those things are operating uh, at, at an optimal state. I'm not confident we're there at this point in time. Uh, but most importantly for me, uh, is we need clarity as a business community and what our ambition looks like and what the post-vaccinated New Zealand world looks like. And I'm less concerned actually about the timeframes, but I want clarity, what are the triggers that allow us to move out of our uh, current state. And I think it's imperative that we see more transparency and more communication between government uh, and the private sector about what those triggers look like. Uh, and certainly that's what I've been advocating for. And at the moment, trying to build a, a greater and more comprehensive conversation between business and government around those issues. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, over to you, Helen. Thanks, uh, Fran, and good morning, uh, everyone. Well, perhaps some uh, comments first from me about the uh, review that I was asked to co-chair, uh, which was uh, requested by the World Health Assembly, the world's health ministers, uh, appointed as a co-chair uh, last July. Uh, terms of reference, secretariat set up, panel operating for the last six months since September, and we're working towards having a report out 
uh, in uh, the first half of, of May. In fact, we will have a report out in the first half of May. Uh, we had a, a January report uh, out, which uh, gave some uh, indication of our, our thinking, uh, which in essence is that at each uh, step along the, the chain, uh, from the preparedness to uh, early notification and alert uh, to responses, uh, things broke uh, down. And uh, from that, uh, we, we bring our diagnosis of how an outbreak became a uh, pandemic, which, in our view, it need not have uh, become. Uh, on preparedness, uh, the metrics used uh, globally clearly have been based on a kind of tick the box uh, uh, approach because you have you know, major institutions like Johns Hopkins, uh, which had put their names to the Global Health Security uh, Index, which rated the US first and the UK second in preparedness for a, a pandemic event like this. New Zealand was 35th, by the way. Um, none of this held up because they hadn't taken into account factors like uh, political uh, leadership, uh, social uh, cohesion, uh, science denialism, a range of factors, which of course have had such a bearing on, on where the uh, pandemic got major traction and, and where it, it didn't. So our task now is to move from the evidence gathering, uh, the diagnosis, uh, then to uh, the prescription. I think there's, uh, you know, probably a largely emerging consensus about the, the, the diagnosis, and quite a lot of agreement uh, around the areas where the prescription should should focus. But the devil is uh, always in in the detail. Uh, one point I think I'd, I'd want to really emphasise is that even if uh, the uh, preparedness had been good, uh, the notification had been timely, uh, the WHO had been bolder with precautionary moves, uh, if the uh, declaration of the public health emergency of international concern had been two weeks earlier, if countries had by and large reacted the way they did when the public health emergency of international concern was declared, we'd still be in the same mess we're in today. And what has really bemused uh, our panel is looking at the timeline and seeing the very blank month of February last year, where most countries, including our own, sat around and watched. And I think because we dodged a bullet with SARS, uh, Ebola never came near uh, you know, most countries, uh, somehow people unrealistically thought that in this highly globally interconnected age, an outbreak uh, in China, didn't really matter much else apart from around the, the, the borders and the, the near region. Well, that's proved very, very wrong. And I think it wasn't until uh, things ran away in, in Italy and uh, Dr. Tedros eventually used the word pandemic, which has no legal meaning for the WHO, that people suddenly thought, yeah, good grief, <laughs> this, this could be us. And, and the rest is, is history. So some pretty painful uh, lessons from that. Um, uh, I don't want to uh, opine too much on the on the economic uh, side, but just to really reinforce what uh, Rob said, I'm hearing exactly the same uh, kind of, of, of feedback now and apprehension about what the year has uh, ahead for us. Uh, border as primary line of defence has been uh, very important for us. New Zealanders are incredibly risk averse. They look at the rest of the world and they see mm. us, uh, apart from the you know, free song from time to time in, in, in Auckland. Uh, we're at the sports games, we're at the concerts, we're you know, here, there and everything, carrying on a normal life, except it isn't uh, normal <laughs> in, in the context. And so how we, we step out of that is is quite fraught. Uh, we'd all love to see the Trans-Tasman bubble, but the you know, headline news this morning, 78 people hospitalized in Queensland, not just you know, cases, but hospitalized, that will get people thinking, well, you know, how keen are we? Uh, so you know, public opinion, I think, will weigh quite heavily on the government's uh, mind uh, in in this. So so there's, there's no quick going, uh, well, there's no going back to what there was. Uh, the question is what the new normal looks like and whether we're smart enough to navigate uh, around it. And for my pennies worth, <laughs> what I would say is 
upskilling Kiwis for the vacancies in the labour market is, is incredibly important at, at every uh, level uh, uh, of it. Uh, clearly uh, providing uh, the quarantine arrangements for the workforce uh, that is needed and largely the more skilled level uh, to come in. And then thinking very, very hard about whether we're providing the kind of ecosystem which would encourage the incredibly talented Kiwis and innovators who've come home uh, to stay and build their business base from here. Because if we don't provide that ecosystem, it's easy enough to get, for them to get on the plane and go back to where uh, they were prospering uh, once, once vaccinated and feeling a bit more confident about uh, those places. That's it from me for now, Fran. <laughs> okay, thanks, Helen, for that reality check. Um, a sobering, I might say. Um, Peter, to you. Well, I might start, I chair what's called the International COVID Scenarios Project, which is a joint project between the International Science Council, WHO, and United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction. And, you know, I think that project is already illustrating what are the four clocks that are working on different synchronies around this pandemic. First is the biological clock. How will the virus evolve? How will the vaccinologists beat the, compete against the virus? And that will have very different implications in different countries, between those that can afford updating the vaccine if necessary, between those who may not even have access to the vaccine now for several years. And I'll come back to that. The second clock is the social clock. And I think we need to recognise that the right raise of the rise in rates of mental health disorders after Christchurch have taken still are there ten years later, and I think globally mental health issues and the other social issues that emerge of loss of educational opportunities and so forth are going to leave a very long global tail. The third is the um, the economic clock. And there, Fran, I'd turn back to people like yourself, that how will the world get out of this raft of quantitative easing and other things that have happened, which may lead to some quite interesting conurbations in the financial markets over time. And the fourth clock is perhaps the most difficult. Does this unleash a set of geostrategic games that we've already seen them at pl play in the in the in the in the pandemic, which have other implications, for instance, in the Pacific or elsewhere between different parties with vaccine nationalism and other things that are going on. New Zealand chose the path of elimination, and I don't think there'll be a New Zealander who doesn't believe that wasn't the path to take. And we did it because we moved early. And I think I take Helen's point and agree, but the one thing we did do is relative to most countries, we moved early in relationship to the number of cases we had in New Zealand and shut the borders with uh, relatively early. So we now have two issues. How do we open the country, the country's borders to other countries that close that chose a similar strategy? And the obvious one is Australia and potentially also Singapore. We could actually, even with what goes on now, still find common agreement as how to manage that if we agreed to common decision making over when to make regional sh shutdowns, provided we dealt with some of the issues that Rob's talked about. We are not still efficient at rapid testing. We're not using all the technologies that are available for rapid testing. We're not joining up in ways that are most useful. But when, if we get beyond thinking about bubbles, so to speak, with other countries that have an elimination strategy, our problem is you cannot open the borders significantly until we have high levels of vaccination. And the vaccination has to be for the vulnerable population. So the Maori Pacific populations really worry me because type 2 diabetes turns out to be one of the most sensitizing uh, conditions to, uh, to, uh, to morbidity from the virus. And so getting beyond the bubble, which is fundamentally a diplomatic issue between Australia and New Zealand, not a scientific issue, is going to require serious focus on the vaccine, getting rapid testing in place, uh, and then a set of diplomatic discussions 
which are yet to really consolidate around vaccine passports, around vac- or, or which vaccines are validated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an awful lot to do in which New Zealand should be taking a more leadership position uh, if New Zealand is to open up to the world once we have adequate vaccination. And if you ask me what the number is for adequate vaccination, I think that's a very high percentage of the Maori Pacifica population and other vulnerable populations, but particularly those. In terms of kickstarting the economy beyond that discussion, I think the big discussion New Zealand has to come to is the one Helen's just mentioned in her comments. We're not going to go back to business as usual. We're not going to go back to a world. Uh, the COVID situation has, has exposed a lot more discussion about sustainability, other aspects of growing. And New Zealand needs to grow up about its R&D strategy, its technology strategy, which is still designed for the 1980s, not for the 21st century. And there are all sorts of aspects of that which we could discuss. So just looking at uh, the immediate um, economic situation, clearly there's a limit to how much more debt we can uh, take on board uh, to uh, fund this elimination strategy at a period where we're still getting bordering versions and um, you know, breakouts from time to time. Uh, is there a case for not just thinking about bubbles, but actually thinking about um, corridors, export corridors, business corridors between specific uh, countries, trading partners, and I'm not thinking here just tourists and family um, connections, but actually to enable business to get done? And what might that look like? Is there a kind of recognition of um, mutual recognition of vaccines, uh, perhaps a limited uh, time that you might be quarantined in a particular country? Because one of the issues is um, how do we keep those connections going through this time? Open to you all. Well, we have a low trust model uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, many countries are now going to self quarantine for people who have meet certain criteria. I think the combination of vaccine, rapid swabbing, and, and minimal isolation is a way through that, provided one had agreement on the documentation evidence around vaccine and the testing. The testing now using these rapid tests can be done on site on arrival very easily. And uh, I think that the combination of those would allow some clever decisions say with a country like Singapore that has already got low, low very low or minimal viral load. I think if I can add a perspective as well to your quick question, Fran, you, you know, at this current point in time, we're prioritising New Zealanders and essential workers effectively coming into New Zealand. As you look at how we uh, kickstart and, and mobilise our economy emerging out of this current phase, uh, I think you're bang on the money. We should be prioritising who are our, our most important trading partners and how do we create a regime that's going to be effective for movement between New Zealand and that trading partner? Who are the most important non-New Zealanders we should be letting across the border in terms of people that want to relocate their businesses here, create jobs, move us up the uh, you know the the productivity scale which is of, of being deep concern to us for a long long time we actually need to be very focused very disciplined and, and to some degree quite mercenary about understanding how we uh, protect our interests going forward because we to Peter's point we just it cannot be open slather we just don't have the capacity the wherewithal and the defenses uh, to be able to manage uh, that scenario. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, with Peter and Rob. It, it, it calls for a very smart, very strategic, very uh, tailored approach. And I think uh, while the word mercenary sounds hard, harsh, it, it's right. You know, we need to be looking at where is now the opportunity for, for value creation, value addition to to the economy. And if, if smart ways of getting those who have the means to help us uh, move it along are, are needed. We, we, we've got to look at them and, and enlist all the technology, as Peter says, to, to make it work in a smart way. Um, uh, Peter and also Helen, you've both painted a picture where this uh, 
pandemic uh, is becoming endemic. Um, do you, I mean, what's your best case scenarios for us actually coming out of it and being able to resume as much of our old norm as possible? Or is the new norm going to be so significantly different that we really all do need to rethink our future strategies? I think the new norm is going to see many of us very, very uh, <laughs> cautious. And, and let me go back and perhaps build on the, the comments, uh, the detailed comments that Peter made about uh, vaccines. In the January report that our panel did, we highlighted the issue of, of vaccine inequity uh, because prima facie, it, it's unfair that you know, we in New Zealand will get our rollout uh, this year and in Sierra Leone, you might be waiting for another three. Oh, who, who knows? Uh, so now we're focusing on how that inequity is uh, affecting what's happening with the vaccine, uh, the, the continued rampant, uh, with the virus, the continued rampant transmission, the more variants, the more uh, need for the you know, stepped up scientific and, and vaccine response. The worst case scenario really is we're like a dog chasing our tail globally because we get everyone vaccinated and then we've got to be revaccinated. This this is calling for a, a step up in, in production and distribution of vaccines at a scale the world has, has never seen uh, but before. Uh, so all that is a, is a little bit sobering. And, and the sooner uh, at, at least the, the first round of vaccines can go out as widely as possible to try to curb transmission associated with all the other uh, public health uh, measures which 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 do work uh, the, the more you can start to, to sketch out what a future would look like but uh, right now the, the way patterns are one one feels that you know we might feel confident in time if we've got our up-to-date vaccinations going to other countries which have kept kept theirs up and creating if you like our our own bubbles looking forward but are we going to want to get on a plane and go to the national parks of tanzania or brazil i don't think so the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Peter, do you want to... Well, I think Ellen summed it up. I mean, unless 100% of the world is vaccinated, then then at the, there are going to be... The, the virus is going to attack those who are vulnerable uh, if you have absolute freedom of movement. And therefore, therefore, and at the best will in the world, not everybody's going to accept vaccine. There are many reasons for vaccine hesitancy. And there are people out there or actors out there who are driving a lot of vaccine hesitancy in some countries, particularly in Europe and North America, which are places where lots of New Zealanders want to do business and relate. So that, yes, New Zealanders will be vaccinated, but not every New Zealander will also be vaccinated. And depending on what the number is that of New Zealanders are not vaccinated, we leave a risk on our population as the borders open up. And this is the complexity of the situation that that it comes back to the point of that this is actually a global issue, not just a national issue. Thanks, Peter. Um, we've just got a question from uh, Judith Collins, who's on the line, and um, I'm not sure how I bring you up, Judith. Oh, I'm here. <laughs> Can you hear me? Right. Um, uh, hi, Fran. Hi, everybody. Look, um, I really enjoyed listening to the panel. I was nodding go. all the way through and um, uh, feeling I was um, enjoying and, and um, uh, agreeing with everything. I think one of the things that um, I'm left with, obviously, a few issues. One is, what is, is all this debt going to look like at the end of it all? I mean, I'm just really concerned that we have are going to have vast um, levels of debt and whether or not all the countries that have been um, essentially quantitative easing, um, what's what's going to be the answer there or does it not matter as much as we, we normally think it does because everyone else is doing it or is it more difficult because we're a smaller economy? And the other is surely um, with the development of technologies from this, this is surely the time where we should be saying um, you know, we've seen the ultra-fast broadband was absolutely um, essential to keeping at least most businesses functioning in some way during the lockdowns, then surely this is the time when we should be ramping up technology. I was I was nodding all the way through thinking Peter Glattman, Peter Glattman and some others have obviously seen our technology policy for the last election, but um, putting all that aside, we 
surely this is the time we should be rethinking some of the stances that we've taken over the years. Um, we have become very complacent about biotechnology and um, thinking that the world was going to stay just the way it is. I just think we're going to come back into a world which is looking, going to, to be much keener to um, move ahead and we've just got to be right up there. So I just wonder if there's a couple of questions in there for you. Do you all? Rob? I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, to kick off. <laughs> There's a treasure trove of, uh, <laughs> of of challenges in there. I mean, if I just start with debt in general and the question around uh, quantitative easing and printing money, it makes me very very nervous. You know, I've mm. always been somewhat dubious around uh, Keynesian economics. It, it's it, Sooner or later, that has to be inflationary, right? You just can't throw money out there and devalue your currency without it being inflationary, which ultimately uh, puts, puts pressure on interest rates and, and all this debt looks fine when interest rates are so low. But if you roll the clock forward and, and we see interest rates pick up, that starts to get very scary for a lot, a lot of countries and the stability of the global financial system. So I fear there's a gotcha downstream there somewhere it makes me nervous as you look at that question in relation to New Zealand um, the, the debt is what it is the question is how we use that debt effectively to drive the, the economy out of, out of the situation and I fear if we don't move at speed to your point technology is one dimension of it I fear if we don't move at speed mm we will squander some of the upside opportunities we have right at this moment. I do see several, and, and I mean, these are significant organisations, technology organisations wanting to move head offices here, wanting to establish operations in New Zealand because they believe that continuity of work, continuity of our response to COVID is very strong. Um, there's a real opportunity. We have to let those people across the border. We have to support the creation of those tech hubs uh, here in New Zealand, both to stimulate the development of our own uh, training and, and future workforce framework, as well as attract that uh, talent across the border. And we need to be doing it now. You know, if, if the rest of the world opens up faster than us, people will start to deploy and, and move that capital in different uh, directions. So. So I, I kind of see a long-term warning on the horizon of the payback that comes from all this quantitative easing and debt. Um, mm -hmm. I see a short-term opportunity if we can be agile yeah. enough to, uh, to wrap our hands around it. If I could just chime in there, both you mm -hmm. and Helen made that point in mm -hmm. August at the, mm -hmm. um, at the mm -hmm. Auckland summit. Um, yeah. Why is it taking so long to actually get movement in these areas? I think, you know, un understandably, the country's really been pretty much in a reactive mode to you know, each phase of the pandemic uh, that's come along and the challenges that, it, that it's raised. I mean, the reality is that, you know, it, at any previous time in modern times, uh, anyone would be horrified at the level of debt with, that we've run up. However, let's qualify that by saying that we went into it in a, in a reasonably strong position. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and that goes back a number of years. I mean, I, I remember when I left office, the global financial crisis was just you know, really coming at us very, very strongly. But we went into that with deep pockets and we, we've come out of it and, and through it with reasonably deep pockets. However, there's a limit to the deep pocket if, the, if you keep, you know, uh, uh, digging into it. So you, you do have to be uh, extremely conscious that, you know, endless borrowing is is not there are limits uh, before you start you know, getting the downgradings and other things that become extremely troublesome so i think i think the key thing really now is, is the growth strategy in this very abnormal situation uh, of, of huge uncertainty more uncertainty than probably any of us have faced in, in the economy in our lifetimes uh, and that comes back to being smart i agree with judith about the need mm -hmm. for investment in 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 the in the technology uh, innovation based mm. economy. I think it's absolutely critical. I think we need to re examine uh, clearly aspects of the model which have seen us rely uh, too much on mm. uh, low cost imported labor. We, we've just got to have a fundamental reset about how we move up the value chain and, and use 
the advantages of, of skill, innovation, uh, etc., that we have. Uh, I'm not going to comment much on the fiscal side of things, except to say we're also at the mercy of what will happen globally. And I think that the quantitative easing situation globally leaves the risk of the kind of another Asian crisis, where mm -hmm. some where else in the world will trigger a collapse, which will lead to a lot of flow on issues for New Zealand. And I think that mm -hmm. certainly some of the people we've been engaging with in the COVID scenario project see that as an almost an inevitability at some time downstream. Mm -hmm. And we need to be prepared for that situation domestically. I made the comment about not going back to business as usual. There is a there's a global tendency of people almost to think that we can get back to business as usual and it will never be the same. And in New Zealand, the two biggest industries are not going to be the same. Tourism is not going to be the same as what it was. And while agriculture might be in the short term, and we've seen how important it has been economically in, the, in this last year, if we add in climate change and all the other things downstream, it's not going to be the industry it was. And it too will need to change using technologies in different ways. But I think we all would agree that we need to get beyond New Zealand's traditional she'll be right approach where we've lived off tourism and lived off agriculture and the, the small businessmen called farmers to the point where we start to live more off our brains and our innovation mm -hmm. skills. And that needs a fundamental shift. New Zealand is still only spending from the public Perth. 60% of what other comparable countries spend on R&D. We have a lot of deficiencies in our, and a lot of misincentives in the science system. We don't see cities in the same way other people do, particularly Auckland, as a unit of innovation, which in most countries it's the city which is a unit of innovation. We have certainly the points that Helen and Rob made about taking the window of opportunity that is narrow and is closing uh, to, to get those people that want to relocate significant activity to New Zealand for various reasons. We may miss the boat in mm -hmm. favour of Singapore or, or Western Australia or somewhere else if we don't move agilely. And we need to think about uh, uh, perhaps, it sounds like an old-fashioned word, industrial policy, but we're seeing around the world countries being a lot more strategic in the way they think about the sectors they want to grow. We may need to think now about a much more active industrial policy focused on technology. Mm -hmm. can, can I, friend, just maybe chime in with just one point that's a confluence of, of much of this, and, it, and it's 5G, right? You know, when we talk about debt, when we talk about where we deploy that in terms of infrastructure, and we look at the opportunity and challenge. 5G is a big challenge for this country. We're small, we've got a small population. If we leave it to market forces, we could actually get a very suboptimal uh, outcome. We should be designing collaboratively how we're a world-class 5G economy because without having that infrastructure in place, we don't have a hope in hell in attracting and building the technology economy that we want to. It's, a, it's, it's just a a card that you need to even uh, get entry into the game. And I'm, I'm not sure those conversations at the moment are happening with the level of, 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 of agreement across business and government that's required. The other point I would make is New Zealand has a very low position in global value chains. I think mm -hmm. one of the most lowest of any OECD country. And as most products involve multiple, and most innovations involve multiple economies working together in, in different ways, again, linking us up appropriately and finding ways to be uh, move up the global value chain is a critical part of this discussion. And it, it does need quite a lot of active management to think about how we would do that. Um, you covered, uh, all of you, a lot of the things that have been coming uh, through on the chat in that um, this need for investment in, away from just tourism and um, you know issues like that, which we've relied on in the past. Um, you talked, Rob, about uh, the dialogue with government, uh, business, and yet the Prime Minister has disbanded the business advisory uh, group, I understand, and you might be able to tell us a bit more about 
the informal groups that have now been set up. But we're still hearing from um, you know people like Rob Campbell, uh, Joan Withers, and others that we don't have enough transparency uh, between what government's trying to do and what business wants to do. Um, how can that actually be changed? Uh, it- yeah, I'm working, um, I'm investing a lot of energy and time and and trying to make, create a better uh, interaction uh, between the government and businesses. It, it, it's quite a challenging space, right? You know, business wants certainty in what is a very uncertain world. Um, uh, my message into government is, look, business understands uncertainty. You know, if you can create... Uh, scenarios and make sure that business understands the assumption those scenarios are built on. If those assumptions don't prove to be true, then business can deal with it. They deal with with the scenario planning uh, every day. Uh, that that that's that's manageable. From the government side, um, I understand. Like you know, every time they say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen, they get hammered uh, in the media. So they're naturally uh, cautious and conservative. And I'm also very respectful that it's important that the prime minister and government carry the support of people with them, because if they lose that, we've seen what happens overseas when you get a breakdown in that social contract and that political contract. So so this is a challenging space. Um, I, I, I do see a movement where um, certainly from the Prime Minister, I've been involved in a number of sessions where she's engaging directly with groups of business people around uh, the vaccine rollout, testing ideas, uh, around how uh, the Trans-Tasman bubble could open up. Uh, we just need to see more of that. We do need to see more transparency. I, I think the business community needs to give the government um, more leeway to share things transparently, expecting and, and acknowledging that everything they say won't turn out to be true because there's so many un- unknowns in the world today. And if we can create that level of trust or, or platform for the prime minister and government, then I think they'll be prepared to be more transparent. Is, um, is the platform sufficiently uh, wide or large? I mean, at the moment, a lot of it has been driven out of government. I know Australia uh, put in place a private sector commission as well to work in this area. Have we got the right sort of structure, given that this is likely to be a very long game uh, from what you're all saying? And also, um, you know, the Prime Minister's own energy. I mean, she's also got to run the other aspects of the country as well. Helen, maybe you might have a view. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, you raise the idea of a private sector commission. Uh, Why not? I mean, I think it's one of these occasions where we need the best brains from across all sectors, universities, research, private sector, you know, the, the non-governmental sector, you know, really actively brainstorming and contributing to open policy debate about the future we can have and the circumstances that we're in. There's, there's no monopoly on, on, on wisdom uh, here. Uh, I, I would suspect that the, the, the cap capacity uh, within the public service to brainstorm on these things is, is not what it needs to be. And therefore the, the outreach needs to be wide and the, you know, the networks need to be activated to, you know, to give the government a, a better feel of, of the wide range of options that there are that need to be worked through. But if we're, if we're waiting for, you know, public sector advice to, uh, to create uh, the way forward. I, I don't think, I think we'll be waiting a while. Okay, I'm now going to take uh, more questions from the floor. So, um, uh, and on the line, a um, number of you have um, traversed pretty similar areas and have quite lengthy questions. So maybe Rebecca, um, you've popped up Rebecca Smith, um, a considerable range of questions, but I think this bit about, um, if you would like to take your last question, please. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm... I'm hearing some really similar themes through this and certainly in private conversations around um, the business community, people are saying, now is our time. Perceptions of New Zealand have shifted. We're seen as a creative, innovative country. So now is our time to to create that new economy and that new New Zealand that we are talking about here. Um, The observation is that this tends to be pigeonholed into 
a digital strategy. We need a digital strategy or a technology strategy versus looking at it um, as an entire sort of new economic landscape that we could create. I'm interested in the panel's views on what they think the key barriers are to us succeeding at this. Who would like to take that up? Short-term oh. partisan politics, to be frank. I mean, <laughs> I think what we're talking about here is fundamental changes in the way New Zealand thinks about itself and moves ahead. And certainly, I mean, I've written in my sense has written extensively on the multi-dimensional shape of New Zealand's future. This is this is happening at a time when there's many other things we need to address, which extend beyond partisan uh, considerations, such as climate change, such as the fact we're only 19 years from the 200th and at the bicentenary of the treaty, which obviously is going to lead to a number of changes in the way New Zealand operates. And so I think there is a real need to encourage that conversation across all the parties, non I don't mean the political parties, across all the actors in New Zealand to get a consensus on the kinds of fundamental shifts in the way we're going to have to operate. Because there's going to have to be investment in a broad range of areas to grow the economy, but also deal, deal with a number of social challenges which have only been exacerbated by the, by the pandemic, be it in mental health, be it in educational disruption for many young people and so forth. So the echoes here are quite complex. And it, I mean, there was great hope, I think, at the, you suddenly mentioned transparency. The Epidemic Response Committee was, even though it was a political process, was actually very helpful in encouraging transparency early in the pandemic. And I think, yes, it got conflated with the election cycle and therefore fell to bits. But I think there are things that we could do to continue to encourage conversation that gets beyond partisan politics. Now, that may be naive, but I think the issues that we're dealing with here do transcend the normal political cycles from the centre-left to the centre-right, which New Zealand goes through over every, every few years. Are you suggesting it should be reconvened, the parliamentary committee? Well, something like that would help give confidence to the transparency that I think Rob was talking about, that everybody needs to understand what, what is really going on. What we're seeing now, I think, doesn't give enough people enough understanding of what's going on. Okay. Um, what are the... K K Sorry. K Fran, I was just going to also offer a perspective. I mean, my, you know, I've spent most of my career, uh, to be honest, staying uh, well clear of uh, government. So it's kind of I've got new insights as a relatively kind of naive kind of newcomer to uh, to what goes on. And one of my observations is that you know, government is very good at policy. They're not necessarily uh, very good at strategy. Um, and a lot of things get compartmentalised within different ministries and so on within government. The strategy piece of saying, you know, what is our ambition and vision for New Zealand in 10 years' time? What what does the future of our workforce look like? And if we're going to move up the productivity cycle, what sort of jobs are we building and educating for in, in 10 years' time? What sort of investment are we looking to attract to support that economy as we envision it in 10 years' time? What is the impact of AI? What is the impact of climate change? It's, it's hard to get clarity and to Peter's point, then have a pathway that doesn't get disrupted every time we have an election you know, in, in, in two or three years. And, and that I think is a big challenge. And this is one of those disruptive moments in the history of nations where you know, we can use this as a catalyst to create and start to envision a future that's different. Um, but firstly, we have to build the capability to start doing that envisioning because I don't believe that exists today within government or between government and uh, and the other intelligent minds uh, throughout the country. Yeah, this is a point which is coming through on a number of um, uh, comments on the uh, chat and one of the one of the issues, the role of women. I won't go through all of these because uh, they travel in a lot of territory, but. Um, one of the issues which has been pointed out is what about women in this? And women, of course, have been, um, you know, 
not great beneficiaries of COVID. It's where jobs have been lost. Um, what are we doing to ensure that during a recovery that we actually play back in, um, you know, women, other people in the community? How do we do that? Helen, do you have a view? To ensure women are also um, utilised yeah. in the recovery. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the differential impact of COVID. You know, men die more, uh, but women have lost jobs and livelihoods more. Uh, and there's a, a range of reasons for that. They've, they've tended in a number of economies like our own to be more uh, prominent in the hospitality and, um, and retail sectors, which have taken a uh, hammering. But there's also some uh, evidence that uh, the, the stress is placed by by COVID, even for those whose jobs could continue working online, have been very difficult for women because if your children aren't at school and your children aren't in childcare and so on, then, then people have made uh, decisions in a range of countries to, to opt out of the workforce because they just can't, can't deal uh, with everything. And uh, you know, one of the things going forward is to ensure that if there is going to be more working for, from home on a more permanent basis, and, and I suspect there will be, uh, how do we provide the you know, necessary supports for that? Not only the, the, the high quality broadband, but, but also the accessible uh, uh, childcare. You know, e even things like uh, our planning, uh, making it easy for people to put you know, the, the garden shed or the granny flat for the office outside on the property. At, at the moment, you try to do that, you're probably hit with a thirty to $40,000 resource consent fee. So that's a, that's a bit off-putting. Uh, California has a, has a boom in sort of backyard um, constructions like this. And, and one of it is, you know, solution to, part solution to housing crisis. But another is that people just want to get out of the house and away from the kids in order to, to work because they don't go to the office as much uh, in, anymore. So I think, you know, injecting a, a gender perspective and, and the way we plan uh, ahead will be uh, extremely Im important. And I, and I don't really see that lens coming through in most countries' uh, responses. I have a num number of other hats where uh, we, we, we look at this and uh, I think, you know, women need to get organized and start putting their demands on the table as to, you know, how, how the future can be planned uh, with, with their engagement uh, and with their priorities taken into account. Yeah, um, a question here from Della Fan. Would you like to um, voice that? Della? Are you still on the line? Della? Okay, it, it, the question is, could it be possible that New Zealand is left behind and being motivated to create a fundamental digital change because of the relatively safer bubble during the COVID pandemic, while the rest of the world is forced to digitalize to cope with COVID isolation? Who would like to take that one on? Rob? Uh, so I'm, I, I, think, um, I, I think the theme of the, or, or the under lying principle of the question, I'm not sure if necessarily it's digitally driven, but I think the risk that our success in this phase becomes an Achilles heel in the next phase, I think is very real. I, I mean, the challenge for the government to transition New Zealanders away from feeling safe, I think you opened up with a comment that says, you know, life feels relative, or one of this it may have been Peter or, or, or Helen, you know, life feels pretty normal, apart from the fact our border is closed. Um, feels quite safe and comfortable. And for many people whose livelihoods haven't been affected, some have clearly, uh, it feels pretty good. And, 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 and that safety can absolutely deal complacency and, and result in us being slow to move out. And I, I, think, I think that is a risk. And I think that's a real challenge for the government now to move the mindset of the population, to look to the future and understand we'll need a different risk profile as, as we look to that future. I, I agree entirely with, with Rob that, uh, you know, life goes on here. People think it's normal, but it isn't because we can't pay our way in the, in the, in the current circumstances. Uh, I think, you know, it's not just a question of, um, you know, stepping up on, on digitization, 5G and, and so on, all extremely important, but also a time for, for capital investment uh, to, you know, in effect, take out the need for the, the 
large scale, low cost uh, imported labour. If you look, for example, at the response of the UK, which, which has also relied on such labour for a lot of its basic uh, uh, crops and, and agriculture, um, and they couldn't get the imports. I'm, I understand there's been a lot more investment in capital equipment uh, than an infrastructure than we've seen here. Here there's been you know, voices saying we, you know, we need to import the, the, the labour. But I think if we focus more on the, the capital investment, taking up those low cost jobs and uh, upskilling our, our own people to fill the vacancies where we can. I, I wonder if also the, the, the message has penetrated really across the New Zealand population that it's not all just going to be okay when the vaccine comes, that we are in a new reality. You know, we are going to, to need to reorganize around a new normal with an endemic uh, disease. And uh, I think if, if that reality hits, people will be more in the, the mindset for thinking about the, the fundamental changes that need to be made. I mean, I think I agree with both Rob and, and, and Helen, but I would add yeah. that this, we are in danger of reinforcing our old cultural she'll be right attitude. Yeah. And, and really, I think we're going to have oh. to have a real uplift in national ambition and, and, and as Rob put it, in strategy thinking and strategic thinking. And I think, I think I am scared that we're going to drift on in this complacency for much longer at the very time we need some really serious discussion to take advantage of the, and address the challenges ahead. I'm going to have to wrap very shortly, but I just um, would like to just go around the panel and um, ask you each for one sort of resounding thought you would like to plant with the government and the opposition for that matter, but also business about what you would like to see as a priority in the environment we're in, perhaps starting with you, Peter. Oh, I think there's two separate issues. I think one issue is obviously about uh, having a more open conversation about where New Zealand goes and being inclusive on that. And the second is the practical matter of preparing for the reality that at some point we will first open up the trans-Tasman bubble. And secondly, we'll have to then start opening up to the world. And as Alan's point, Helen's pointed out, confronting the fact that there will be some endemic presence of the virus at, in New Zealand at some point. Thank you. Um, Rob? Yeah, I guess my plea would be, um, you know, to not be afraid of, of articulating and setting out an ambition uh, for the country and then mobilising the country around uh, the transition path uh, to get there. I, I think the more we can be open and transparent uh, the more we have the opportunity to bring people along with us and move them to the new reality of whatever that new reality is. I think too much is, is behind closed doors at, at, at the moment. Uh, building Finally, on, Helen? Yeah, building on what both uh, Peter and Rob had said, I mean, what was remarkable about New Zealand last year was the way the country pulled together to you know, mm. endeavour to eliminate COVID and keep it out. And you couldn't have done that just by the government issuing edicts. The public had to believe it was possible. So I think in the same way as, as people were, were brought together to make that, that possible, uh, government now needs to lead in engaging New Zealanders in a conversation about the future. And that means putting all the facts and scenarios on the table and uh, you know, really trying to you know, get people thinking about uh, the, the way ahead where everyone's view matters. You know, what sort of society and economy do we want to come out of this uh, collectively? Can the the quote overused phrase, but can the team of five million now apply its mind uh, to that? Of, of course, there'll be some you know, political differences about the emphasis on this, that or, or the other, but there's actually a lot people could agree on you know, the broad parameters. So that, that I think is, is what needs to happen now. Engage New Zealanders in this conversation with as much as can be put on the table about uh, what the scenarios are and how we move out of our comfort zone and, and, and confront the future. Thank you. I would now like to pass to Circle CEO Tanya Ozil to close. Well, I have to say that uh, when your report first came out in July last year, we were eager 
to to have you on the platform and I, I just have to say on behalf of Johnny and Sharon and all of our team what an honor it is that we finally got this off the ground and and what better timing to do it so thank you so much for making the time this this conversation is more important than ever it is about remain a new 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 Zealand and what this country is capable of that you have so much talent and we have so much talent here we have so much great entrepreneurship so many great ideas how do we commercialize them? How do we take them to the world? And how do we get New Zealand behind the vision? So on that note, I will say on behalf of us at The Circle, we're committed to bringing the business community together to keep this conversation going. We would love to help steer this conversation into action. And um, I know that uh, all of us in this business community want to see change and um, and vision and it's very exciting for us to start the conversation so we might not be able to solve all the problems but at least we're talking about it and on behalf of all of us Fran thank you so much you are wonderful you're a personal and a professional friend and then Peter Rob Helen amazing to have you with us today thank you to everyone joining us and let's keep this conversation going thank you